Potter, and I serve as executive director of your Legal Aid Society. Cleveland, oh, thank you, thank you. Cleveland is part of our official name, but our reach extends from Lorain County on the west through Cuyahoga, Lake, Geauga, and to Ashtabula County on the east. 1.8 million people live in those five counties. 275,000 of them live in poverty. In Cuyahoga County alone, about 220,000 people live below that threshold. In the past year, 83% of the clients legal aid served made less than $25,000. Extending the reach of justice to all, not just those who can afford to pay, is the thread that connects everything we do. Last year, we impacted more than 18,000 people through 7,700 cases, addressing issues of safety, health, housing, economic security, education, and employment. Each day, we provide services at no cost to clients to protect their right to a fair shake in our judicial system, regardless of ability to pay. Hi, everyone. My name is Karen Giffen, and I have the distinct pleasure of serving as the board president of the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland this year. While we are here today in this warm, dry space enjoying a meal together, within walking distance of us are community neighbors who are facing eviction. They're struggling with the health consequences of a legal issue that has spiraled out of control, frustrated because their child was denied access to school, facing an uncertain and scary future. Day after day, it's our job to reach out to people living on that margin. We meet them where they are to deliver the legal services they so desperately need. Now, many of us are familiar with the United States Supreme Court building in, in Washington, and the quote that's on the west side of that building, it says, equal justice under the law. But fewer of us notice the other side of the building. That quote says, justice, the guardian of liberty. Legal aid is where and when people need help, not only to provide equal justice, but to preserve and ensure all our freedoms, all our liberties. Today, we will share some statistics, present some wonderful awards, and look into the future of legal aid. But the single most important thing we really hope you take away from today is that each of you is a key person in legal aid's ripple effect in our community. Through your support, we stabilize a client's life at a key moment in time. That, in turn, creates stability for a household. And ultimately, legal aid fosters a stronger and thriving democracy. This is a day of affirmation, a celebration of liberty. The first element of this individual liberty is the freedom of speech, the right to express and communicate ideas. Hand in hand with freedom of speech goes the power to be heard, to share in the decisions of government which shape men's lives. Everything that makes man's life worthwhile, family, work, education, a place to rear one's children and a place to rest one's head, all this depends on the decisions of government. Therefore, the essential humanity of man can be protected and preserved only where government must answer, not just to the wealthy, not just to those of a particular religion, 
not just to those of a particular race, but to all of the people. Each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope, and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Like it or not, we live in interesting times. They are times of danger and uncertainty, but they are also the most creative of any time in the history of mankind. And everyone here will ultimately be judged, will ultimately judge himself on the effort he has contributed. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. It chokes me up. Tiny ripples of hope. Each one builds on an earlier ripple. Each one can lead to future ripples. We have 80 people on the legal aid team creating those ripples. 45 attorneys who have an average tenure of 20 years and 35 additional staff members. And we all like to root for the home team, don't we? Go Browns. <laughs> that amazing video features our home team, our staff, our clients. And Northeast Ohio is lucky to have an extraordinary home team in the Cleveland Legal Aid Society. I know because I've heard from them that leaders nationwide routinely call out Cleveland's Legal Aid for its innovation, its results, and its professionalism. And when those national leaders want somebody to talk to other legal aid organizations, or when they need somebody to speak to national political leaders about civil justice, they call on Colleen Cotter and her staff. On behalf of the board, this will choke me up again, we are so proud to work with and for the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland. That inspirational video does an excellent job of showing us the wonderful effects, the ripple effects that we are here today to talk about. I want you to see these change makers, all of them, live and in person. If you are a Legal Aid staff member, please rise so we can acknowledge and thank you. And now we want to recognize some specific staff members for their extraordinary work. You can read more about each of them on page six of your program book. The recipients of the Claude E. Clark Award for Outstanding Service are Philip Althaus, staff attorney, <laughs> Lynette Feliciano, intake specialist, and Daniela Lachina, social worker. Okay, congratulations.
and the recipient of the C. Lionel Jones Lifetime Achievement Award for Outstanding Staff Leadership and Vision is Dennis Dobos, Senior Attorney. And that was Dennis, who actually received the award for Outstanding Staff Leadership and Vision. And apparently, <laughs> I need better vision. The C. Lionel Jones Lifetime Achievement Award goes to Marley Iger, who is Senior Attorney in Legal Aid's Painesville office for 40 years. Congratulations, Marley. Award recipients, thank you, and can we all give them one more round of applause? Congratulations to Phil, Lynette, Danny, Dennis, and Marley. I am so privileged to have a front row seat to your work every day. And I would like to recognize one more of our amazing colleagues, Bob Bonfius. Bob is retiring at the end of the year after a 41-year career as a legal aid attorney. Congratulations, Bob, and thank you. One big reason why our legal aid team is so good is because they are curious and innovative, always looking for ways to create change. We constantly ask, are we making our clients' lives better? For example, did we increase access to health care? Did our work lead to a home safe from violence? Did we prevent homelessness? Did we contribute to economic security? And the answer is, yes, we did. I am proud to report that once again in the last year, our attorneys secured access to health care in 96% of cases where that was an issue. Secured safety from violence also for 96% of clients. Prevented 99% of evictions we handled and we increased our clients' assets and income and reduced their debt by a combined $14.2 million. Well, we could quote numbers all day long, but it's really the stories of actual people and their families, not just the numbers that bring the work of legal aid alive. You caught a glimpse of two of our former clients in the video. Let me tell you more about Ms. Hughes. We represented Ms. Hughes when she was faced with wrongful eviction and the very real possibility of losing her housing subsidy. We went to mediation armed with a solid defense to the eviction. During the mediation, Ms. Hughes turned to the landlord. She thanked him. She thanked him for taking a chance on her and giving her the opportunity to have her first home. I dare say people don't usually do that in the middle of an eviction. We negotiated a settlement and the case was dismissed. With the weight of that eviction off her shoulders, Ms. Hughes was able to breathe. She could focus on the goals for her family. She saved up money and she fulfilled her dream. She bought a house. Today, her kids are thriving and growing. Are you beginning to see the ripple effect in action? You also caught a glimpse of Dylan McIntosh in the video. I met Dylan after he had received services from Legal Aid. 
I was at an event and he was the bartender. And we struck up a conversation and he learned that I was this year's president of Legal Aid. He shared with me that he would not have been able to graduate from Tri-C except that he got Legal Aid assistance. His Legal Aid lawyer helped him maintain his housing. Now you see, Dylan had grown up and grown and aged out of foster care. He did not have a family network to help him become an adult. He needed help with a wage dispute and understanding his rights under a lease. Now, to those of us in the rooms who are, who are lawyers, that sounds pretty simple, but certainly not to Dylan. The advice and help his legal aid lawyer gave him was crucial at a key time in his life. And we can tell you that he graduated from Tri-C, he's now at Cleveland State getting a degree in urban studies, and oh yes, he's thinking about law school. We have many, many more stories, many more examples of the ripple effect in action, but you get the picture. So instead of more stories, allow us to share the words of former clients telling us how Legal Aid's help impacted them years later. I am now a successful person doing a lot better, thank you. My son was not expelled from school and was able to graduate from the school in our community. I was able to go to school and get an associate's degree from Tri-C. It had a major impact. I was able to rebuild my credit. The bankruptcy has since fallen off my credit report and I have an awesome credit score. Thanks. Peace. I was no longer attached to an abuser, free to start over. Those quotes illustrate how legal aid delivers results with long-term positive consequences that make individuals and therefore our community strong. In addition to our work for individual clients, legal aid's work for community change also has broad impact. For instance, last year at this luncheon, I talked about our efforts to create a lead safe Cleveland. We are both working with and keeping pressure on the city of Cleveland to make Cleveland safe for children. I am pleased to report we have made significant progress. As a result of our work, the city has now begun to place warning placards on properties when owners fail to remediate lead hazards. More than 300 homes were placarded in June alone. This is progress, but we, we have a lot more work to do. We will continue to focus on this issue, I pledge to you. We will work with partners, with funders, with the city leaders and community leaders until we do indeed live in a lead safe Cleveland. These results do not occur in a vacuum. They start and come to life because of Legal Aid's strategic plan under the leadership of our board. Karen is absolutely right. Our staff is amazing. And we are also blessed with incredible board leaders and committee leaders. Their guidance is second to none. I'd like to ask all of our Legal Aid and board members and committee members to please stand so we can recognize you. to recognize four board members whose terms are ending this year. They have all been so engaged with legal aid, it really is hard to imagine the board without them. Special thanks to Pat Haggerty, Aaron O'Brien, Mary Jane Trapp, and President Emeritus, Vanetta Jameson. Would Pat, Aaron, Mary Jane, and Vanetta please stand?
as I look across this room, I see many who are longtime supporters of legal aid. And a whole lot of new faces, too. Legal Aid has a vision to extend the reach of justice, and all of you are, an imp are important to turning that vision into a reality, and thank you for being a part of it. At this time, we'd like to highlight some of our exceptional partners who extend the reach of justice. First, we present our Legacy of Justice Award to the Cleveland Public Library. For the past seven years, the Cleveland Public Library has helped bring knowledge of legal rights and services to our community and has distributed several thousand bits of legal education materials to that community. Will all of our friends from the Cleveland Public Library stand and be recognized? Our second award today is the Legal Aid Community Impact Award. Each of these partner organizations hosts monthly legal aid clinics for community members. They collaborate with us to identify needs. They spread the word about legal aid in our community. They extend our reach throughout our five counties, um, helping legal aid be where and when our clients need help. The recipients are Oberlin Community Services, Catholic Charities of Ashtabula County, and the Veterans Administration Community Resource and Referral Center. our friends from Oberlin Community Services, Catholic Charities of Ashtabula County, and the VA Community Resource and Referral Center, please stand so we can recognize all of you. Thank you so much for your partnership. Our highest award is the Lewis Stokes Paragon Award. Congressman Stokes had a long history with the Cleveland Legal Aid Society. Among those ways that he contributed was serving on our board of directors. Those who were privileged to know him are well aware of his unending effort to bring people together in pursuit of justice. I've had a long personal relationship with the Legal Aid Society. Sitting on the board of the Legal Aid Society is an opportunity to help promote the good that society does in our community. They are doing an extraordinary job of providing access to equality under the law. And that, I think, is so important as a lawyer. This year's recipient of the Lewis Stokes Paragon Award is our partner in creating a healthier community, the Metro Health System. We are celebrating 15 years of our medical legal partnership. Metro Health has welcomed our attorneys onto their team to remove barriers to health through the legal system. Together, we have served thousands of patients by addressing the social determinants of health and achieving great outcomes. Without exception, our families do the best that they can, but they face barriers that are sometimes overwhelming. 
The medical legal partnership with Legal Aid gives me a partner who is trained in the law. We work together to meet the complex needs of our patients. But the Legal Aid lawyer can also take the issue to the next level and work system-wide to make changes for the community. Given a choice, I would never practice medicine without having a lawyer by my side. <laughs> I love that quote. <laughs> Accepting the Louis Stokes Paragon Award is Chief Executive Officer Dr. Akram Boutros. Dr. Boutros, we thank you and your colleagues for your partnership with Legal Aid. And while he comes to the stage, will all of our partners at Metro Health please stand and be recognized. Thank you. Oops, here we go. We've done this a few times. Clean. Oh, wow. I was using, I guess, my indoor voice before. So thank you very much, Karen and Colleen. On behalf of the Metro Health System and its 7,700 employees, we are honored to walk in the path laid by Congressman uh, Louis Stokes. Uh, Congressman Stokes, the gentleman from Ohio, a champion of the poor, used his influence to create and expand jobs programs, health clinics, and housing and urban development. He was a true champion of the poor. This, uh, this award, which Metro Health incredibly, is incredibly thankful for and humbled by, belongs to the Metro Health employees who are here today and there's 7,700 colleagues, most of whom, thankfully, are hard at work right now in dozens of places across Cuyahoga County and beyond. They, like Congressman Stokes, are champions of the poor, of the uninsured, of the sick, the injured, and the thousands of people in need of an advocate, in need of a friend, like the congressman, this is more than a job. It's a calling. And it has been that way since the day Metro Health was founded 181 years ago. So thank you very much to the Legal Aid Society for your partnership and the goodwill you've created so that we can, together, continue to better more lives. As Robert Kennedy said on the video, each of us is standing up for ideals, acting to improve the lot of others, striking out against injustice. We are sending forth ripples of hope. These ripples are growing stronger, accomplishing more, lifting all of us, especially those oppressed by injustice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Boutros. And thank you to all of our partners at the Metro Health System. You are truly amazing. In addition to all our partners here today, there are many others who pitch in to help over the course of a year. For example, 3,000 attorneys signed up to provide pro bono services with legal aid. More than 200 law students volunteered, and 2,000 financial supporters stepped forward to help us grow. Together, we are making a better five-county community. We want to talk now about the future the future of legal aid, 
the future of our clients. Now, we know it's uncertain, but we think that future is strong. We know resources continue to be tight, and a good economy it does not lift all boats. We know economic projections for Northeast Ohio are challenging. We know our clients will continue to face injustice based on their race, their religion, citizenship, sexual orientation, and gender identity. We know the American dream for our clients is a long stretch. And we know these factors combined will lead to an increased need for the services of the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland. And we know we will continue to be the only organization addressing the civ civil legal needs of Northeast Ohio's poor, marginalized, and disenfranchised. We will remain the one organization that can use our justice system to tip the scales between shelter and homelessness, safety and danger, economic security and poverty. The intervention work legal aid does where and when people need it helps to preserve our community investments. For example, when an eviction is prevented, kids get to stay in their neighborhood school. Their education is not interrupted. And when a survivor of domestic abuse is able to separate from her abuser through a divorce, she becomes much less exposed to stress and danger. At the beginning of this year, we launched the Campaign for Legal Aid to extend the reach of justice in our community. We did that to ensure our work both continues and grows. We've identified three priorities for our campaign. The first priority is impacting more families through partnerships, bringing legal aid to even more families living in poverty where they seek services, live, work, and go to school. Our second priority is removing barriers to opportunity. For instance, our Housing Justice Alliance, investing in the community by providing tenants the right to legal counsel to increase housing stability. This work removes barriers to education and employment. And the third priority is elevating legal aid as a catalyst for community change by, for example, educating housing authorities and public utilities on customer rights, creating a lead safe environment for children, and addressing issues of court fees and fines that impact far too many people living in poverty in Northeast Ohio. The campaign for legal aid just started this past January. It's taken off. It's met with great early success, receiving some extraordinary gifts from individuals and groups both within and outside the legal community. Many who have already embraced the campaign are in this room today. You can read more about the campaign, its leadership, and its goals on pages 10 through 12 of your program book. Much of our early success is due to leaders from our community who have stepped forward to volunteer their support, led by our honorary chair, Paul Harris, and by co-chairs Jan Roller, Dick Pogue, and Doug Wang. We have a terrific campaign cabinet helping us extend the reach of justice. Would our campaign leaders and cabinet members please stand and be recognized? much today about our ripples of hope and now you can be part of this effort and create your own ripples. At this time I am proud to introduce a team of individuals from a variety of backgrounds who have a special message. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? No. Now can you hear me? <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Dee Haslam, and I'm really honored to be up here for a special announcement. And along with me are Paul Harris, Rich, all giving speeches, by the yeah, way. No, no, no. Rich and Robin Garcia and Bob and Judy Rawson. 
Um, and each of us have a story of why we're involved in legal aid, as all of you do as well. Uh, my, my story is a brief one, but when I was in my 20s, I was a patient advocate for a mental health hospital in Knoxville, Tennessee. And my job was to find a home and a placement for the patients that were re ready to leave the hospital. And without legal aid, there was no way that was going to happen. So it was really a fortunate to have that early introduction to the great work of legal aid. More recently, our players have come to us and want to get involved in social justice causes. And what better organization to team up with with legal aid of, here in Cleveland to help with opportunities and to reduce area, barriers for those individuals. So we're really excited about that. But what we're most excited about today is all of us are teaming up together to offer a $40,000 match for every dollar you give today and now through December 1st. So in your packets or somewhere on your table, you'll see this card. So you can text or you can fill out this card and we'll, pro we'll provide the match and we're really happy to do that for you today. As well as, don't forget the long-term vision and on this card, if you wanna give to the long-term vision, that would be outstanding as well. So thank you for your time today and on behalf of all of us, we're really happy to be able to su provide this support. Thank you. Well, well, thank you, Dee, Judy, Bob, Rich, Robin, Paul, and Michelle, and I'll say it again, go Browns. Go Browns. Please do give by December 1st. Your support will extend our reach to more people in our never-ending quest to remove barriers. Your ripple will foster the next one. It will promote family stability. When that happens, families begin to escape poverty. And that goes directly to the ultimate ripple, a stronger community. Together, our job is to make those ripples. At Legal Aid, we're going to do that by hiring excellent attorneys and staff and give them the resources they need to get great results on behalf of our clients. Thank you for the time, talent, and treasure you devote to our mission. Together, you represent the very best of what we can all do for our community. At the outset today, in the video, you heard a clip of a Robert F. Kennedy speech. His words, spoken 52 years ago, still resonate today. Each time a person stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, they send forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Let's answer Robert Kennedy's call to action. Let's together build a current extending the reach of justice. Thank you. And now I would like to call forward Jan Roller to introduce our speaker. It is my honor to introduce today's keynote speaker, Deval Patrick, the former governor of Massachusetts. And I'm proud to say, my friend. And I guess it's appropriate that I fulfill this role at this event because it was legal aid work that introduced me to him. He and my husband, Dave Abbott, became friends during law school when they both were student attorneys at the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau. That turned out to be the closest my husband ever came to practicing law. <laughs> but it launched Duvall's on a distinguished legal career. A federal court clerkship, attorney at the NAACP, Legal Defense Fund, head of the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, general counsel to major corporations, and partner in major law firms. 
But in 2005, he made a decision that took the political world by surprise when he announced that he was running for governor of Massachusetts as his first ever attempt at public office. His long shot candidacy turned into overwhelming victory on the strength of his skills and person personality that were already apparent in law school. His intelligence, charm, empathy, eloquence, and cooking ability. Wait, uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Duvall had all of these qualities when he arrived in law school, honed by having grown up poor on the south side of Chicago and winning a scholarship to a private school outside Boston and then to Harvard College and then Harvard Law School. All of his life experiences, and I've only touched on them, have made him an exceptionally capable leader. So capable, in fact, that no matter what organization he has previously led, and no matter what he might possibly lead in the future, I can say with total confidence that he, that it will never have been led by a better cook. Yes, it's true. Uh, many a time during law school, Dave and I would have dinner at Duvall's where he would whip up some delicious treat after another. So memorable were they that I recently went to my recipe box at home and pulled out this. A piece of paper headed Law School Memorandum with the date March 5, 1982. It's Duvall's recipe for chicken fricassee with white vermouth sauce. It's fantastic. And I know his remarks today will be too. Please welcome Duvall Patrick. Jan, my goodness, all manner of secrets. Thank you very much for the warm introduction and um, you know, especially knowing the vision, the, uh, the advocacy and the service you have exemplified for so long, but come on, really? My menus? I hope one day to become the, man, the man you describe, let alone the cook. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege privilege for me to join you this afternoon to recognize the incredible work of the Cleveland Legal Aid uh, Society. Thank you to uh, Dee Haslam and her team for the wonderful announcement. The icing on the cake would have been to confirm that my friend Condi Rice was joining the coaching staff. <laughs> I want to uh, also acknowledge all of the honorees um, who were recognized today for their good work and to thank Karen Giffen, Colleen Cotter, the Leadership Cabinet, and all of the staff members and volunteers who carry on this 113-year legacy of advocacy for those in need, for families facing foreclosure, renters facing eviction, and elderly trying to age in place with dignity, for the immigrants caught up in a broken system in desperate need of reform, for people with disabilities who seek only enough accommodation to lead ordinary lives, imagine that. For the survivors of sexual and domestic violence and the working poor and the left out and left back who need a little help to help themselves to the American dream. And thanks to all of you here who support the work of the Legal Aid Society. You don't have to be a lawyer to appreciate the importance of the rule of law, just ask Dave, or the civic commitment America has made to justice for all. Thanks for stepping up. The ripples of hope you create strengthen not only our communities, but our democracy. And yet many of the gains, much of the momentum you, your work helped produce is up for grabs. Today, our national commitment to social and economic justice feels uncertain. The self-evident truth that all people deserve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness seems a long way from settled in the American mind. It's not just that our civil rights are less secure or that our political rhetoric is more caustic, it's that our moral foundation feels shaky. So I was eager to be here this afternoon because there are big questions before us as a nation, moral questions, I think, 
And what better place to reflect upon them than here with you? As Jan said, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I lived there with my mother, my sister, my grandparents, and various other relatives who came and went in our grandparents' two-bedroom tenement. My mother, sister, and I shared one of those bedrooms and a set of bunk beds. So you go from the top bunk to the bottom bunk to the floor every third night on the floor. I went to big, broken, overcrowded, under-resourced, sometimes violent public schools. Now, my grandmother would say we weren't poor, just broke, because broke is temporary. Of course, in the 50s and 60s on the south side of Chicago, most folks were from down, so down south, as we used to say, and brought southern ways with them, southern speech, southern food, southern storytelling. Naturally, that included church. For me, that meant the Cosmopolitan Community Church at the end of, of the block, to which my sister and I were sent every Sunday morning, bribed by the promise of a big bre breakfast with homemade biscuits when we got home. Cosmopolitan Church had in common with every black church the transformative power of music and the presence of old ladies in hats who took the business of worship seriously. For all the things we didn't have on the south side of Chicago in those days, one thing we did have was a powerful sense of community. Because those were times when every child was under the, under the jurisdiction of every single adult on the block. If you messed up down the street in front of Ms. Jones, she'd go upside your head as if you were hers. And then call home, so you got it two times. <laughs> those adults, adults taught us that membership in community is understanding the stake you have in your neighbor's dreams and struggles, as well as your own. The other lesson I learned, mainly from those old church ladies in hats, was about the importance of having a moral foundation. Not about sanctity or sanctimony or any sort of moral superiority. Just a set of expectations they had of us, to, and most importantly, that we were supposed to have of ourselves about how to behave and how to treat others. Those old ladies used moral guideposts in everyday life through ordinary, even old-fashioned notions about not leaving your conscience at the church door. They taught us that faith is not just what you say you believe, but how you live. These lessons of community and of having a moral core have stuck with me. If anything, they've become more important to me as I've gotten older. They've shaped my life and increasingly the way I think about policy. Because I'm convinced that before we can fix our policies, whether they are in job growth or edu education, in immigration or the justice system, we have to fix our politics. I'm not just talking about tone or hyper-partisanship or a willingness to compromise as important as all of that is. I'm talking about more fundamental notions of community, this notion that we have a stake in each other and of justice. The notion that beyond the political left or the political right is right and wrong. That is, that we reap what we sow. That's the approach I tried to bring to my work as governor. That's why we invested time, ideas, and money in education, innovation, and infrastructure. And that's why after eight years, Massachusetts ranked first in the nation in student achievement, first in the nation in health care coverage, first in the nation in energy efficiency, in veteran services, in entrepreneurial activity, and so much more with responsible budgets, the highest bond rating in our history, and a 25-year employment high. Lord knows we didn't get everything right. <laughs> Let me say it over your applause. We didn't get everything right. No mortal ever does. But I can confidently say that we worked hard to do all the good we could in all the ways we could, for all the people we could, for as long as we could. We tried to leave things better for those who came behind us. Because I know, and you know, that we reap what we sow. 
a couple of weeks ago, in an act of hateful violence, a gunman shot and killed 11 people and wounded seven others while they prayed at Shabbat services at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. He shouted anti-Semitic rants while he fired. Those killed ranged in age from 54 to 97 years old. Did I mention they were praying when he opened fire? Because it was the eve of the midterm elections, or maybe just because we are in the times we're in in America, cries went up that the coarseness of our political rhetoric had given rise to this crime. And when we learned that just before the massacre, the shooter had posted on social media that he was about to avenge anti-immigrant misinformation spread by elected officials themselves, many Americans asked themselves and our leaders hard questions about whether sowing such seeds of fear and division were bringing a dangerous dark fringe of society into the open. The morning after the Pittsburgh shootings, I was at Sunday services at Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston. Of all the places to be, the very place where just a little while ago a white supremacist shot and killed nine worshipers at the end of Bible study. That Sunday morning, you could feel the weight, not only of Pittsburgh, but of Mother Emanuel's own tragedy a few years earlier. You could feel the weight of the shooting of the two African-American shoppers in Kentucky a few days before that. You could feel the weight of the unarmed black and brown men and women killed unjustifiably by police, the weight of the children taken from their refugee parents at the southern border, the weight of the words and deeds of fear and division that have become the regular and bitter diet of our politics and experience today and time after time through our history. And yet they did not cry out at Mother Emanuel to be delivered by someone somewhere else. They didn't appeal to some distant faith. First, they prayed for the comfort of their brothers and sisters in Pittsburgh. Then their pastor, who in the coming days would travel himself to Pittsburgh to pray alongside the rabbi at Tree of Life, preached a common sense truth that words do, in fact, matter. Then, at the altar call, they welcome. It's hard quite to capture the power of this simple scene, but I, I want you just to try for a minute. Here was a place where one might fairly have expected and indeed have excused a little holding back. After all, that very welcome had been recently fatal in that place. And as people began to come to the altar, black people and white people, I will confess that some of us who were visiting were a little tense, praying, if you can imagine it, with one eye open, as it were, to see if anything or anyone looked a little out of place. But not the pastor, not the deacons, not the church director, choir director, not one of the regular parishioners. Their welcome was unhesitating and unflinching. They knew that the hate visited on Pittsburgh and on Kentucky and on themselves was but the reaping of what others had sown. But they also knew that if they wanted to reap love instead of hate, justice instead of injustice, it was within them and up to them to sow better seeds, kinder and more loving seeds. They were living their faith. And what I saw was greatness made possible by goodness. There is a reminder in here, I think, for all of us. I think the founders intended to set this nation on a moral foundation, not in a religious sense so much as in a civic sense. America is an exceptional nation, but not 
because of economic or military might. Nations of great wealth and arms have come and gone with the march of time. America is exceptional, exceptional because we are the only nation in human history, not organized by geography or religion or race or language or even a common culture, but instead around a handful of civic ideals. And we have defined those ideals over time and through struggle as freedom, equality, opportunity, and fair play. On the promise of these ideals, America has been the hope of the world. In a way, the founders played the role for the nation that those old church ladies play played for me. They designed America to be a nation with a conscience. We cannot be great without being good. So while it is true, so while it is true that our economy is strong and our military is powerful, while it is true that we have dazzling achievements behind us and extraordinary potential ahead of us, America is yet to be all that we were meant to be. When we take children from their parents to discourage them from seeking sanctuary here from violence and despair, remember that we cannot be great without being good. When bullets fly in houses of worship or in schools or in nightclubs or in grocery stores, and our leaders choose the slogans of the gun lobby over the lives of innocents, remember that we cannot be great without being good. When unarmed black and brown citizens are shot down by unaccountable police, when our justice system is not yet consistently just, remember that we cannot be great without being good. But it's not just today's headlines that ought to trouble us. Consider the everyday neglect that has become a part of our routine and expectation. When we are in the midst of a knowledge explosion, where, the only, where only the well-prepared will excel. And yet we continue to let public schools fail poor children. Remember, we cannot be great without being good. When the economy moves on and leaves broken communities and broken families behind, and the best we offer are either empty slogans or a shrug, remember that we cannot be great without being good, when we can always find a way to afford a weapon system the military doesn't want, but not the health care a young family needs, remember that we cannot be great without being good. When we choose a power grab over a fair vote or the wishes of the wealthy over the needs of the weak, remember that we cannot be great without being good. Instead of spattering our civic square with mud, instead of fueling extremism and hate with a barrage of tweets and a 24-7 cycle of outrage, how about we try a little old-fashioned love of country, by which I mean love of what really makes America great. I don't know when patriotism got reduced to lapel pins, flyovers, and questions about whether pro football players should take a knee. In America, in America, patriotism demands conscience. It demands sacrifice and generosity. It demands grace. It demands respect for the values of freedom, equality, opportunity, and fair play, even when it's inconvenient, even when it gets in the way of party politics even when it compels us to be mindful of and compassionate towards the lowly, the vulnerable, the different, and the despised. And it makes those demands on all Americans, from the meek to the mighty. That is our civic faith. Patriots have a moral obligation to keep that faith. Sure, we should debate what part government should play in meeting those obligations. But let's not forget in the heat of that debate that government is just the name we give to the things we choose to do together. And that social and economic justice was the point from the start. Fortunately, more 
of these patriots are beginning to make their presence felt, and I'll leave you with this point of evidence. Three years ago, in my last year in office, America faced a crisis not unlike today's when unaccompanied children, some as young as three and four years old, were flooding across the southern border, having fled over thousands of miles from violence in Central America. And just like now, the federal authorities were overwhelmed. So then President Obama asked a number of states temporarily to shelter and care for some of the refugee children until they could be processed under our laws. Feelings around immigration ran, ran hot then, just as now. Nevertheless, I agreed that our state would help because cha accepting the challenge to temporarily shelter poor children fleeing unspeakable violence was to me an act of patriotism. America has given sanctuary to desperate children for centuries. We rescued Irish children from famine, Russian and Ukrainian children from religious persecution, Cambodian children from genocide, Haitian children from earthquakes, Sudanese children from civil war, and New Orleans children from Hurricane Katrina. Once in 1939, we turned our backs on Jewish children fleeing the Nazis and it remains a blight on our national reputation as I fear the recent separations will be remembered. The point is that our esteem and our power has been enhanced when we rescue children and diminished when we don't. My decision was an act of faith too. I believe one day we will have to answer for our actions and our inactions. My own faith teachings are very clear about how we are to treat the least of these, every major faith tradition on earth charges its followers to treat others as we ourselves wish to be treated. Still, I knew that our, our offer of shelter would be controversial. Indeed, for that decision on hate radio and social media, I was called everything but a child of God. <laughs> a couple of days later on uh, an unusually quiet Saturday morning, my wife Diane gave me a list of things to go pick up at the local Home Depot. It turns out in our household, anyway, you cannot be elected to an office so high that you can't be sent off with a honey-do list. <laughs> it was early in the day, and uh, I thought I'd just run out quickly on my own without bothering our, uh, the state troopers in our security detail. They didn't like it when I did that but I knew exactly where I was going and where to find everything on my list. So I set off in the truck dressed in a t-shirt, jeans, flip-flops, a baseball cap, and dark glasses. It didn't matter. I was outed by the manager in the very first aisle. Governor Patrick, he said, welcome to the Home Depot. How can I help you? I encountered a man in the checkout, checkout lane who was angry. He wasn't house, hostile or, or threatening. He's just really, really mad and loud. And he confronted me. He said, uh, he said, Governor, he said, I couldn't disagree with you more about your offer to shelter these children. He said, my own wife is an immigrant. She came here uh, legally, and that's the way it ought to be. He said, I want you to know I think you were wrong. And at that moment, it would not have helped engaging with him over how being a refugee is in fact legal under American law. I simply thanked him for his feedback. But let me tell you, it was clear to everyone in that vicinity who was mad at whom and what he was mad about. I had six other encounters on the same subject in the store that morning. In each of the others, someone came up and whispered, Governor, I'm with you. Or, Governor, you're doing the right thing. Or, Governor, thank you for standing with those kids. The calls to the office were two and three to one in favor of sheltering those children. And it struck me afterwards how we've come to, to whisper our kindness and shout our anger. I don't know how... I don't know how we've come to this, if it's our reality TV culture or shock radio, radio, I don't know what it is, but I do know it's upside down. I think it's time we learn to shout kindness, to shout justice, to shout compassion. 
Blessedly, we're starting to see more and more of that across this country, more and more people coming off the sidelines and standing up for America at her generous and optimistic best, from women who are demanding to be treated with the respect and decency everyone deserves, from survivors of domestic violence and abuse demanding to be seen and heard and believed, from the black and brown people who are demanding consistent professionalism and the presumption of innocence from police, from students who are demanding that we choose their lives and safety over the proliferation of military weapons in civilian hands, from all those lawyers, maybe including some of you, who showed up in airports after the Muslim ban, demanding respect for the rule of law, Black Lives Matter, Time's Up, Black Girl Magic, Occupy Wall Street, Families Belong Together. At any given time, on any given issue, they may make us uncomfortable. But they, in this time, have taken to the legislatures, to the ballot boxes, to the courtrooms, and to the streets to lay claim to this democracy and ultimately to the American conscience. And they, in this time, are depending on the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland. And so are the rest of us. So keep it up. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Governor Patrick. Thank you for coming to Cleveland. Thank you for sharing this day with us. And thank you to all of you. Go forth and build a wall of ripples to tear down oppression. Thank you and have a great day.